gentlemen and friends, uh, good evening to you. Uh, I want to do a couple of things uh, today. Uh, very quickly, first of all, I, I just want to note that this is the International Holocaust Day. And just to, to bring to the forefront in our memories, uh, for remembrance, uh, for prayers, if that's what you believe, just what a terrible, terrible, terrible tragedy we had. Uh, so many years ago now, when the lives of so many people were brutalized to such a terrible extent, and, and the world was changed forever as a result of that. More than six million people brutally murdered uh, from across every spectrum, every part of society, uh, families in the millions devastated, lives changed forever, and the implications to this day and forever, and we should remember and because we remember, we should make sure that there is never a chance that something like that will occur again. And as we watch what happens in Eastern Europe right now and what uh, President Putin and Russia might want to do, all of these thoughts spring to mind. This is Holocaust Day, a few seconds of remembrance for the terrible tragedy that people faced during that time. And that was ended in no small part because of the service of Canadians, men and women, from coast to coast to coast, not only in the armed forces at the time, with over 1.1 million serving during World War II in the uniform of Canada, but in industry and in every part of society, uh, because the men left, the women took over, and our society changed dramatically during that World War II. Holocaust Day, a few seconds, a few moments of, of remembrance is well worth it and appropriate. Secondly, uh, this is Shots with Soldiers, and we've done quite a few now over the last year and a half, and we've done a lot of soldiers from history, and we've done several soldiers from present day either serving or recently left the armed forces. I'm going to try in the future to put it into a little bit more of a structured format, and I'm kind of going to try that for every soldier we do from history, we're going to try to do two soldiers or two living veterans to, to sort of just show and continue to put in front of Canadians that Canadians of the day also stand and serve in the uniform of Canada with that maple leaf on their left shoulder. I think that's an appropriate thing to do. And so tonight we're gonna to do a shots with soldiers and shots come from World War I primarily where the soldiers before they went over the top, usually at dawn going over the top of the trench to assault the Germans across no man's land through the shell scrapes through the barbed wire and the broken ground and over bodies of soldiers who had been killed there prior. They were often given the shot or more of some kind of alcohol, usually rum, but often what was up, whatever was available. And that warmed the belly, sometimes gave them a little liquid courage, but perhaps more often just gave them the ability to get through the horror and the terror that they were gonna face in those next minutes and hours, and maybe just help them do it and get through it. So you can pick, your liquor or your liquid of choice. It does not have to be alcoholic. It's either rum or a whiskey, uh, whatever you decide to have or water or pop or milk or coke, as long as we're toasting and remember, we'll do this at the end of our soldier here tonight. I'm actually toasting a white wine because as I said, I'm kind of in a little bubble here in Florida. We're not going out much and that's all I could get my hands on for this evening here. So I'm gonna use that as a toast. But I'm gonna talk tonight for just a few minutes about a soldier from Newfoundland, uh, Sergeant Tommy Ricketts, who is a soldier that we're gonna honor here this evening. Sergeant Tommy Ricketts, a, a Newfoundlander. And if you go to Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, everybody in that province in a population of 520,000 will know the name of Sergeant Tommy Ricketts. He was born in Middle Arm in White Bay in Newfoundland. And, and White Bay, Middle Arm is a little tiny fishing community just in the North Center part of Newfoundland. It's about two hours drive on a good day from where I have, a, my wife and I have a, a small house where we spend our summers. And one of our goals is for next year to go to Middle Arm because Middle Arm is no longer a settled community. Somewhere in the forties or early fifties, everybody left, everybody being about 45 people who were living there, left Middle Arm because it was no longer tenable. It was not connected by road. You can only get there by boat. It was a fishing community. And, and Tommy Ricketts was born there in April of 1901 and grew up in that community till the age of 15. And he was a fisherman. That was his, that was his profession, his job. He went to school only for the first couple of years 
and indeed did not really have any formal education. And that was really common at that point in time. And you think about when Tommy Ricketts was born in 1901, he was born into the British colony of Newfoundland. And later, very, very, very soon, but a little bit later in his life, he was a part of the dominion of Newfoundland. And then a few years after that, during the 30s, after the Great Depression and after World War I, when Newfoundland went bankrupt again and our leadership had been killed uh, either at the Battle of the Somme or, or in Passchendaele, Newfoundland became a colony of Britain again. And finally, on the 1st of April, 1949, Newfoundland managed to lure the rest of Canada to join us in Confederation. And so just think of Tommy Ricketts in, in, in the first 48 years of his life, went through colony of, the colony of Newfoundland as a colony of Great Britain, the Dominion of Newfoundland as one of the dominions equal to Canada, the colony of Great Britain, and then as part of the great country of Canada itself. So just the changes that he saw in his life were pretty incredible. In uh, 1916, he went to uh, St. John's. He was 15 years old, uh, and he signed on the recruiter's paper uh, to join the Royal Newfoundland Regiment. He lied and said he was 18 years and three months old. In reality, he was 15 years old and three months when he, when he joined. He could not sign his name, but he put an X on a recruiter's paper. He went off on the SS Florizel, which is a little tiny tramp steamer. And she's actually, the Florizel worked right up until the, the early 70s. It was still tramping the seas back and forth around Newfoundland. And they finally sank her just off the coast of Embry, off Lewisport, about 10 kilometers from where our house is in Newfoundland. And every summer I take my boat, I go over and have a look at the SS Flores, all this rusting ship on the bottom in shallow water. I think about the Newfoundlanders that it transported from Newfoundland to Halifax at times to join other contingents and then onwards across the Atlantic in 1915, 1916, 1917, and then help bring them home in 1918, 1919, some even up to 1920. Went to uh, Europe and into England, and from there forward and joined the regiment in January of 1917. He fought at Montreal of with the regiment the first time. That was in April uh, of 1917, just after Bimmy Ridge. And it's only about maybe 20 kilometers up the road in Northern France from Bimmy Ridge. The Newfoundland regiment had rebuilt from the, the, the disaster at the, uh, at uh, Beaumont Hamel during the Battle of the Somme where most of the regiment was killed or wounded. And again, at Monchy Le Preux, they stopped uh, almost an entire German division that was coming at them and again took horrible losses, but held the German advance and kept the lines intact. Uh, Tommy Ricketts was part of that fight. He was wounded in Cambrai uh, during the Battle of Cambrai in November of 1917. Uh, or October, sorry, October of 1917. He was shot in the left leg uh, with a rifle round. He was evacuated to England, uh, went through about four months of recuperation and rehabilitation and came back and joined the re regiment in April of 1918 when the regiment had now moved up to Belgium. He fought through the summer uh, of 1918 with the regiment around the area of Ypres. And then in the last 100 days campaign, Sergeant Tommy Ricketts was a private, as a member of a rifle section moving forward. And on the 14th of October, 1918, he stood tall for Newfoundland and Labrador and for what he was do, there to do. Uh, the 14th of October, I was thinking about that today and I was saying 14 October, there's another 14th of October that looms large for all of us. And that's the day that Private Jess Rochelle uh, stood tall for Canada in 2006 in Afghanistan. Coincidental? I think not. We have two heroes on that sort of same auspicious day uh, during years that are about 96 years apart. On the 14th of October, 1918, the Royal Newfoundland Regiment was advancing. Uh, they were advancing from an area around Lettingham in, in uh, Belgium, which is just to the east, about 20 kilometers to the east of Ypres, and they're about 10 kilometers south southeast of Passchendaele and the area that was fought over there. And as they were moving forward, they came under fire by a German field artillery battery that was supported by middle, medium machine guns. Uh, there were at least four guns in the battery, maybe five, uh, plus four or five machine guns. Uh, under heavy fire, they kept pushing forward. 
and, and Tommy Ricketts was incredibly brave. And just as they got to the critical point, they ran out of ammunition. They were using the Lewis machine gun. And, and if you ever go and look it up online, the Lewis machine gun was a 7.92 millimeter machine gun. And it had a magazine on top that was circular, flat circle. They either 47 rounds or the bigger ones were 90 some odd rounds. And that's what they were using to keep the artillery from being able to shoot, to keep the gunners from being able to look after their guns on the German side and keep the machine guns that were firing back at them, keep the heads of their gunners down. Just as they got to a critical moment, they ran out of ammunition. Tommy Ricketts got up and he could see that the guns now on the German side had realized that the fire against, against them was not as heavy and it was an opportune moment to get away, get to a new position and set up to kill more Canadians as they thought they were or British coming at them in, in the next hours. Tommy Ricketts ran back under fire himself from the machine guns and the artillery pieces, ran back more than 100 yards, gathered up Lewis gun magazines from, from the trenches where they had left and, and where some of the others were still fighting, under fire again, ran back to where his section was, who had already taken losses, got the Lewis gun back into, uh, into action, drove the Germans who were with that field battery into a, ho a, a farmhouse uh, right in the area there. And, and pushed forward himself and caused the Germans to surrender. Because of the fire he brought to bear and because he made their situation hopeless, they could not escape. There was so much fire coming from that Lewis gun. They could not bring their guns into action because of that same weight of fire coming at them. Uh, eight of the Germans surrendered. They captured four of the field guns, four of the machine guns, destroyed another machine gun, and then about a half hour later captured, captured a fifth field gun all because of the valor and the presence of the enemy of Tommy Ricketts. This incredible guy, aged 17 years old on the 14th of October, 1918. It's interesting that his citation for valor was written up by a company commander in the regiment, Captain Sid Frost. Ever go Google Sid Frost, you know that this guy is one of the individuals who became hugely successful in business in our nation. And in fact, he became the president and CEO of the Bank of Nova Scotia, an incredibly capable individual who served from Beaumont Hamill onwards in the Royal Newfoundland Regiment and was a hero himself. He signed off on the citation for Sergeant Private at the time, Tommy Ricketts. Tommy Ricketts was awarded the Victoria Cross by King George V at Sandringham in January of 1919. <clears throat> he was a very shy guy. He said he went there, went there for lunch, had lunch with a whole bunch of people that he didn't know, was nervous as all could get out, watched everybody around him to see which fork they might use, which knife they might use, because he hadn't seen those kind of meals before. And then King George V came into the room, uh, along with uh, it, one, one of his sons and Princess Mary, who was also there with him. And he said, King George V, who was not renowned for this, immediately put him at ease. He said he talked to him very plain spokenly. He was not condescending. He actually had a conversation with him for about 10 to 15 minutes. Tommy Ricketts was worried dramatically that he was going to, to flub the conversation and say something wrong or stupid. He did not, or at least he didn't believe he did. And after that conversation was over, King George V pinned the Victoria Cross on him and said to the group in the room, this is the youngest Victoria Cross winner in my army. And over there, Sergeant Dighton Proben, Major General Dighton Proben, who was also in the room at 85 years old, was the oldest Victoria Cross winner in the British Army. And he had won his Victoria Cross during the Indian Mutiny, obviously in India way back in the 1850s. Can you imagine? You got a 17 year old boy in that room getting the Victoria Cross pinned on his chest by King George V. And here's a guy who won his Victoria Cross during the uh, Indian Mutiny. Uh, in February of 1919, Tommy Ricketts came back to Newfoundland. He was, he was met and hailed and, and fed it as a hero, made him hugely uncomfortable. And I think one of the marks of his life from then on in was that he did not talk about what happened. He refused to do interviews with, uh, with media or with journalists. He refused invitations to be treated as a hero. When Queen Elizabeth came to visit Newfoundland, first as a princess and then as a queen, he refused the invitations to attend the functions and he, and he wanted nothing to do with marking himself as a hero. 
And, and the one comment that he made to friends was that he thought everybody who had gone through what they had gone through during that fighting should have gotten the Victoria Cross. Quite, quite a comment from, he was uneducated. He went back to Bishop's College and he got that opportunity in truth, most likely because he was a hero. He went to Memorial University, he became a pharmacist and he opened a drugstore in the late twenties on Water Street in St. John's, Newfoundland. He was a terrible businessman. Uh, the folks who worked with him said he didn't order things very well. He didn't keep the books up to date. The expenses that they had versus the money coming in were never fully sort of coordinated or synchronized. And he barely made a living from that drugstore. But the one thing that he, he was remembered for was the fact that the people around who came there wanted to work for him. And, and he treated them so well. He was right across from what was the bus station or the train station, I guess, at the time. And, and quite often in, in that train yard, there were people who got sick or people who had heart attacks or people who got injured doing the kind of work they were doing. And what would happen is instead of going to the hospital, they would come to Tommy Ricketts drugstore and he would put a patch on them, look after them, stop some bleeding if that was what occurred and never, ever, ever charge anybody for his medical service to them. And, and the folks who, who worked for him said, you know, he was renowned uh, for his giving back to the community, not taking from it. He lived uh, a good life with his family, had two children, a son and a daughter, uh, and we're still living. And uh, he died, had a heart attack in his store, uh, his drugstore in 1967, and he died. Joey Smallwood, uh, the last founding father of Confederation, because he helped bring Canada into Newfoundland in 1949, ordered a state funeral uh, for Tommy Ricketts, and it was superbly done. Here's the sad part of it. I grew up in Newfoundland, I was 11, 11 years old at the time, and, and I was already reading military history. I did not even know then about Sergeant Tommy Ricketts and what an incredible hero of Newfoundland he was. It's only in the last 30, 40 years that that history has been reborn, has been brought out and people have, have learned all about him and it's quite incredible. He's buried in the Anglican Cemetery on, on Forest Road in St. John's, Newfoundland. And there is the story of Sergeant Tommy Ricketts. Uh, 17 years old, Victoria Cross winner, wins the Victoria Cross after already being with the regiment, fighting in France and Belgium for two and a half years because he joined when he was just over 15 years of age. So for our shots this evening, we're gonna to toast Tommy Ricketts, uh, is volunteering, signing up, is going on the Florizel to uh, England and then on to France, is serving with the regiment, surviving the wounding during the Battle of Cambrai, recuperating in England, coming back to join the regiment in early 1918, and is valor in the presence of the enemy on the 14th of October, 1918, as part of the last 100 days campaign, as the German army was being put on its back foot and the war was being brought to an end. So here's to Sergeant Tommy Ricketts and his memory. We remember. Tommy Ricketts. Tommy Ricketts. <laughs> Screech, I'll tell you. Thank you. If there are any questions on Tommy Ricketts or any of the other issues that we deal with on Shots with Soldiers, I'd be delighted to respond. But thanks for being here. And for those who will watch it, thanks to you also, uh, for sure. What an incredible individual. Uh, just over 65 years old when he died. That's a young man. I'm still, I say that. <laughs> I say that now. Uh, very precisely. Any, Any questions? questions or comments? Uh, sir, I do have one on the uh, Facebook Live. They wanted to know about his brother, George. George Ricketts uh, was an older brother, and he joined the year prior to Tommy Ricketts, also joined the Royal Newfoundland Regiment, uh, was killed in Passchendaele, and his body was never found. So he has no known uh, burial spot, no known grave in Europe, which, as you know, is not uncommon, from, common, especially from World War I. His name is on the memorial at Beaumont Hamill, uh, where all the Newfoundlanders who have no known resting place, known only unto God are, and his name, uh, Private George Ricketts, is on that memorial at Beaumont Hamill. An older brother who died during the war and uh, no known grave. And if you know, and, and for those of us, I, I see Marianne Barber there. And the last time I was at Menengate, uh, we love you, you know that. The last time I was at Menengate uh, was with Marianne and, and Mark Fusco. 
And, uh, you know, you go to Men and Gate, which is that memorial to those who have no known resting place. There's something like 57,000 names inscribed on the walls of Men and Gate as you enter uh, the town of Ypres, which was, of course, the sound of the place of so much brutal fighting during World War I. 7,000 of those names are Canadian names. Just think about that for a second. 7,000 names uh, of Canadians who have no known resting place. There are more on the, on, on the uh, walls at Tynecott Cemetery, but 7,000 there. And so it was very common because of the artillery, because of the mud, because of the water, because of no man's land. It was really, really common that uh, people were killed and the bodies were never found uh, in some cases because they were no longer in existence. And if you ever wanna see something very interesting, go on and, and, and Google some of the documentaries on the setting up of the uh, Commonwealth War Graves Commission uh, and when it started in 1918 and then 1919 and how they tried to find the bodies of soldiers who had been killed, but the bodies not found and, and what, what led them to bodies and what, how they would recover them. And it's quite incredible. And as you all probably know, we still recover bodies to this day from specifically World War I. And now we're better at identifying because of DNA. And when we, identify, when we find them and when we can identify them, we bury them not as you know, a hundred year old skeleton, we bury them as the young boys that served our nation. It's quite incredible. I was at the, uh, I was at the funeral for Private Peters on the day before the 90th anniversary at uh, Vimy Ridge. And he had died at Vimy. Body had been found and identified. And we had a funeral for him with probably 50 people there. Myself, the prime minister was there, the governor general was there. And oh my God, I couldn't help thinking about this young 19 years old, this boy, right? And, and here we were finally getting the opportunity to pay our respects to him. So George Ricketts is one of those. His name is on the Beaumont Hamill Memorial. Nothing else? <clears throat> I have a quick question. Have other Newfoundlanders uh, been awarded the Victoria Cross? No, he is the only one, Gordon. And uh, I guess that's why it's easy in a small, in a, in a you know, big fish, small pond kind of thing that every Newfoundlander now knows about Tommy Ricketts. And, uh, you know, in Newfoundland, of course, there, there's, uh, the, you know, the arena, the sports complex out in Bayver is named after him. There are streets named after him and, and various plaques out around so we, we have celebrated his service and we've remembered there are no others that have won the Victoria Cross. Sir, I was wondering if you could do a little update on the Jess Lower Shell uh, file and uh, what the, what's gonna happen on the 17th of February. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to do a press conference on the 17th of February to talk about uh, our initiative of valor in the presence of the enemy. And, and our request to the Governor General of Canada, our request to the House of Commons, our request to the Minister of Defense, our request to the Chief of Defense Staff to actually commence a, an independent review of Jess Larochelle's file and citation for the Victoria Cross with a view to if it's deemed warranted, and clearly we think it is to upgrade that, that citation to a Victoria Cross, not the star of military valor that he presently wears, and at the same time, consider how we might reach back into Canada's military history and look at other individuals who served our nation superbly, who were valorous in the presence of the enemy, but because of circumstances, et cetera, either were not nominated for a Victoria Cross or else did not receive one. And I use an example often of that, you know, uh, Fran Private Francis Bagamagabo, Sergeant Tommy Prince, Hero, her, heroic, valorous in the presence of the enemy in a way that was incredible, different for each of them, but courage of a lion. If they had been white men, it is my view that they would probably be, have been wearing the Victoria Cross. Why couldn't we not relook that? Just start with Jess Larochelle, because we believe that is a, a, a soldier whose citation, whose heroics, and whose valor demands attention now. Consider others from Afghanistan. I'd be willing to provide the other names as we would with our group. We're gonna do that on 17th of February. We hope to do it with representation from each of the three parties of the Liberals, the Conservatives and the NDP uh, present as part of that. This is nonpartisan, this is not political. This is about doing what's right for Canada. 
Uh, we have written to the Governor General with our request. Uh, we've written uh, to the Minister of National Defense, to the Chief of Defense Staff. Uh, we have built a, a base of, of, of support, and that's probably the wrong way to put it. We have found that in Canada, there is an enormous base of support for doing our recognition better, for doing this specific recognition right, because we don't think it's right now. We have towns and cities and communities who are passing resolutions to support uh, this initiative. We've got regiments and associations from across the Navy, the Air Force, every regiment across the Army that almost you could name regular force and reserve, not all of them, who are out in support of us uh, with resolutions from their, from their, you know, their leadership saying that they support this. We've got the support of Lieutenant General, now retired, Omer Lavoie, who was the battle group commander on 14 October 2006, who was there with his, with his TAC group from, from battle group headquarters at Strong Point Center, and who fought during that action and who signed off on the citation, who says, I actually think it should be a Victoria Cross. And he reminded me a little while ago that when I went into Afghanistan, after I had seen the citation at the end of their tour, he and I had had a conversation and I had said to him at the time, you know, Jess's uh, citation was as close to a Victoria Cross and we didn't do it, but it was as close to a Victoria Cross as you could possibly want and not do it. And, and maybe now looking in arrears, then we should have done it. We should have crossed that line. We've got the support of Colonel he and Hope and Colonel was the, uh, Colonel Hope was the, uh, Battle Group Commander that, that transferred uh, authority off to uh, Homer Lavoie and, and his support. And, and we go on from there. We've got the support of Canadians across the country in a huge way. Uh, Bruce was talking about the followings that we have and the people who see uh, the things that we do in Valor in the Presence on Facebook, on Instagram, on, uh, on, on, all of the, on Twitter and all of those other things that we do and see things like this. Uh, what we want to do is, is bring this to a consensus, uh, keep the pressure growing. Uh, this is a good thing. You know, recognition equals appreciation. Appreciation makes people believe that what they did was worth the cost, was worth the price that they paid. It is a part of coming home and coming home healthy and remaining healthy. And if you've come home and you're injured mentally, if you are wounded, if you have PTSD, if you're struggling in any way, that, that show of appreciation is a powerful, powerful tool to help you get through those tough times and tough days. And we in Canada don't do it well. I wrote, a, I wrote an article when I was in the United States of America way back in 1998, 99, and said, you know, we have a system of recognition for the 90s. Unfortunately, it's the 1890s, not the 1990s. And, and, and it was very true. We don't do it well. Uh, I watched what the United States has done. And they've, I think, awarded 18 medals of honor from World War II and Vietnam, I believe, and Korea and Vietnam uh, in the last like two or three years. And now they're doing a complete look at some of their com the components of their military to do that. And, and, and somebody said to me, hey, the other Commonwealth countries have said, oh, don't touch it. King George V put in a five-year rule. That is to say, if you were past five years from the action you were talking about, you could not put somebody in for a Victoria Cross. Well, in my view, uh, that's King George V's rule. Now it's a Canadian Victoria Cross. We can do what we like. And what we like should be what is right. Should be what is right. And, and about two days after I was saying that, I read in the news that Australia is asking the Queen to present the Victoria Cross to an 18-year-old sailor from 1942. And so if Australia can do that, if the United Kingdom can do similar things, if the United States of America can do what I just described loosely and it's more to it, then surely to God, we can look at Private Jess Larochel with an independent review and then decide with that independent review how far else and how deep we want to go and where else we want to look to do what is right. Add what you want, dear Bruce. You're the manager. You're our leader. You're driving us. I got a question from the West Coast here. If we got a second, please. Right. It's uh, nice to hear from you, sir. It's Brian McKenna out here in Delta, BC. Um, I guess when I look back at my home unit's history, you see cases of, you know, military medals and Victoria Crosses being handed out three, four months after the action by the sovereign at the time. 
and then you forward to our period of service and even things as low, lower down as like command commendations taking two years, three years to hand out. So do you see this as systemic to the whole honors and award system as being overall too stingy or do you see it as more on just the higher end awards? Uh, Brian, I see it overall as being too stingy. Uh, secondly though, uh, it, it only takes that long and is that slow uh, if you let it be as a leader, and, and I'll tell you, and, and I don't take credit for anything when I was chief of defense staff, except I did articulate to a, a team that was there of leaders, we're going to change this dynamic. And so you, many of you will recall on the 3rd of August 2006, we had this incredible action at the White Schoolhouse, and, and we lost, I think it was three soldiers that day with a variety of wounded, and we ended up with uh, Sergeant Pat Towers at the time and Mass Corporal Colin Fitzgerald. Uh, we had a sergeant from Newfoundland. I apologize, usually I usually had those names at the tip of my tongue. And right now I do not. And a young medic, Corporal Jason Lamont. And uh, that day, the 3rd of August, they were incredible during that time frame, the 3rd of August that week or so, uh, they were absolutely incredible. And, uh, and their citations were written up a couple weeks later. I think it was the 4th of October, I was in Calgary for a, a uh, major celebratory dinner for the military. And we announced a star of military valor and three medal of military valor. So the timeline was two months or even less. We can do it when leaders decide that that's what's got to be done. Uh, if we let it drag on, and I, I've told examples before of when I was a brigade commander and watched trying to uh, recognize people from the from the from the charge into Sarajevo in 1992 and in 1997 being authorized to present that company uh, from the battle group led by Major Peter Devlin, who retired as Lieutenant General Devlin, the Army commander. Uh, we gave that company the subunit accommodation, the Canadian Forces subunit accommodation. We formed up the brigade. I got that company out in front. The problem was out of a company of 240 soldiers that did that, that incredible mission, we had 60 left in the company. So the recognition was almost wasted. Uh, you know, and, and, and it wasn't done intentionally, but leaders have to be engaged to make sure it doesn't drag out that one, two, and three, and four, and five years. We are terrible if we let it be that way. Leaders get involved, it doesn't have to be. Okay. As I have more wine, I'll give longer answers. <laughs> So, sir, I think that's uh, that wraps, up, wraps things up, and uh, uh, this is the last, or this is the 